needed to be further explored. And uh, as you see with the news report, a lot of that has done. Like, a lot more has happened in the past three months since then. And there's uh, been much progress in that area. Uh, next, uh, May 29th, there was a full NRC commission meeting in Maryland. Uh, uh, Mr. Gates and Mr. Carcassi uh, briefed the NRC commissioners as part of the annual agency action review meeting. Uh, Tony Dingle, uh, who was NRC Region 4's uh, NRC person who was over overseeing us, provided a condensed report of the inspection findings from the May 17th Omaha Public Meeting. And then the Commission heard from uh, Gary and Lou on improvement activities at Fort Calhoun, followed by a question and answer session. Gary spoke about OPD's commitments and how the right actions are being taken for the safe restart of Fort Calhoun. Uh, Lou talked about insights gained from the NRC inspections, noting uh, specifically uh, design and licensing uh, basis issues and the corrective action program. He gave an overview of the progress on restart checklists, items, and reported recovery work and outlined the remaining activities. Uh, they con concluded with a detailed plan for sustained improvement, emphasizing the excellent integration. Uh, also, I uh, should also mention that uh, Commissioner Ostendorf and uh, Magwood uh, had come and they both uh, commented about the visit to uh, Fort Calhoun. Uh, Austin Dorf has uh, seen uh, items like the containment internal structure uh, during his visit helped him, him understand the complexity of the issues involved. And uh, Meg would also say that he thought the morale was very good there. Uh, one other item that was in the paper uh, just on June 7th, uh, San Ofri uh, closing uh, differs from that from uh, Fort Calhoun Station. San Ofri uh, is uh, Southern Cal Edison's nuclear uh, uh, generating station. Uh, two operators have been shut down for over a year because of small leaks from the steam generators. Um, Southern Cal requested NRC's permission to restart Unit 2 at reduced power, but after eight months of review and a ruling by the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board, uh, they're con concerned there was uncertainty. Uh, so they decided they're going to have to just close it down. Uh, Gary, when he asked about this, uh, had said that this is, this is a whole different scenario for us. Uh, unlike SANS, we have a defined checklist and a path for restart, and SANS never did have that. Also, steam <coughs> generation generators have performed really well since they've been in, uh, installed in 2006, and we have inspection. And uh, although we are uh, manufactured by the same uh, company, Mitsubishi, the steam generators at Fort Calhoun and SANS differ both in size, design, and technology. So uh, it's a little bit for them. We have a restart checklist and we're going for it. Uh, now we have Lou. Welcome, Lou. He's going to be a regular at the meeting. If, if not, he, uh, Susan, uh, will be here. And so far, Lou. All right. You're, on, you're on the timetable. Yeah, He's no. in the middle of the drill. No, so I don't appreciate right. that. Yeah, the drill started about 828. This is my emergency response facility, so that's a good simulation. You know, events will sometimes don't always happen during the day shift, so actually traveling and getting the facility up and running is part of what we need going today. So, again, thank you and good morning. Uh, with respect to the Port Calhoun Station priorities of safety and performance, fix the plant, uh, continued strong performance in those areas, and I'll highlight uh, several things that we're doing, especially with fixing the plant. And continued improvement in both the corrective action program and our use of training to, to work with our issues at the site. So a big picture of the status of the ongoing work. The station did transition uh, to out its workout rules with the NRC's permission last Monday, and that affords us a lot of flexibility with resources for the covered workers. And that's primarily the operators, maintenance, and then the support technicians. Uh, so that does put us on a 724, closer to what a normal audit schedule you know, looks like, as well as adding several senior managers into the audit control center. And that's a 60-day window that started last Monday. And part of that is the operations crews going on super crews, where we collapse down the number of uh, operating crews that affords us again a lot of uh, additional resources, especially in this phase of a plant recovery where systems are coming back to operations. And it's very operator dependent uh, at this phase of testing. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, with big picture status of ongoing work, I'm just going to touch on a few key areas, um, as well as talk about some key regulatory milestones that have been touched on already. Uh, the mechanical seals for all the low pressure safety injection pumps, that's, uh, that's two, as well as the containment spray pumps were replaced and systems flow tested. And remember, 
Uh, those mechanical seals were part of the Teflon instead of condition as we looked at Teflon and other safety systems other than the containment uh, electrical penetrations. Uh, some additional ongoing work with the high pressure safety injection system. You'll see some even a little bit additional work if we're doing just flow testing and balancing on that system. And that did include the installation of the permanent alternate hot leg injection flow path modification. That, that system is in and we're in final phases of testing on it also. Uh, with respect to the steam generators, uh, both filled and wet layup, and that puts another major system in standby uh, and ready for us. Uh, I'll touch on a couple things on the intake structure. Uh, we did do testing to confirm the adequacy of the flood protection for the wild water pumps. And from previous discussions where we changed the strategy, where now the intake structure sluice gates will be fully closed. And so we did a quite a bit of extensive inspection and testing with divers in the water. Uh, to look at both material condition as well as uh, how well that those sluice gates are performing. Because going forward, we will close those completely. We will install the modification for the operators to have much finer level control in the intake structure. Uh, part of the intake structure walkdowns also included, I think there was a question at the last public meeting about the remaining inspections for the Fukushima initiative. So all 64 access penetrations that were committed to be inspected have been completed uh, with no significant deficiencies identified during the walkdown. That's a letter that we do submit to the NRC. Uh, a temporary modification for additional tornado missile protection for the raw water cable pull boxes. And uh, we talked about that with the, uh, with the NRC back in Washington, D.C. And I'll talk a little bit more about some extended condition work that we're doing for tornado <coughs> missile protection, both for core reload uh, and ultimately for, uh, for plant heat up. Uh, transition just real quick on, in, on uh, equipment qualification. Uh, state's terminal blocks, that's been completed. Uh, our replacement containment penetration feed throughs, uh, it has 92% as of, of June 4th, as of today, it's 98% total project complete. So all the old feed throughs are out, all the new feed throughs are in. And it's uh, post maintenance testing now. So each of those circuits that you know were disturbed with that penetration replacement, uh, we work with the IMC department as well as you remember. It's kind of a canister that goes to the containment. So it's both pressure testing uh, and circuit testing that will complete over the next week. And we prioritize that both for uh, for <coughs> load, uh, circuit testing uh, as well as we'll talk a little bit later about engineering safeguard features testing, which uh, which is starting this evening. Uh, the containment internal structure project again has been completed. Uh, with our analysis and associated operability evaluation, uh, we did do a third-party review that uh, the NRC has been monitoring. Those third-party review results actually were discussed preliminarily with the NRC on a phone call yesterday. A uh, series of questions back and forth with the NRC. Uh, we don't see any significant safety issues or questions that can't be answered, and that will be in the NRC's hands for inspection on June 20th, uh, which is this Thursday. Uh, with respect to the tornado missile extent of condition, uh, that extent of condition has been completed. We have identified the scope of work. Uh, preliminary designs are in progress, and we're taking care of first the core reload items, which is a couple of small tornado protection missile plates in the intake structure. And then to support heat up, there's some additional work that we're going to be doing on both the uh, ox building roof, um, as well as the roof above room 81, which is a room that contains uh, several of our safety related components. And it's primarily structural steel that will put us in compliance really with today's rules with respect to tornado missile protection. Uh, as mentioned, the NRC public meeting on May 17th was held, and, that, and again, as mentioned, that included recommended closure of several of the manual chapter 350 checklist items, which subsequently have gone to the, uh, to the board, and we've got notification of those items uh, being closed, including a couple of additional items uh, that were discussed, that was discussed at the meeting. And again, from uh, currently no greater than green findings that were identified by that team. I'll talk a little bit more about the going forward strategy and the inspections that are in progress now, and that will be, uh, be taking place over the next couple of weeks. Uh, with respect to the regulatory uh, aspect, again, uh, May 22nd, Commissioner Ossendorf uh, visited the site. That also included staff members from uh, both the Nebraska Senate uh, offices as well as uh, staff members from Congressman Jeff Mortuary. So, it was actually, uh, you know, sometimes we run those, you know, two separate tour groups. It was basically one, you know, one big tour group with both the NRC uh, and, and the uh, individuals from the congressional offices. And uh, overall, good feedback, as mentioned, uh, and good eyes on, which we appreciate from, uh, from both commissioners that came out uh, in the April-May time frame. Uh, just a couple of other items. The Nuclear Electric Insurance Limited, uh, weather and machinery inspector was on site for his periodic, periodic inspection on May 22nd. 
Uh, looking at restart activities as well as looking at you know, the major equipment that they uh, that they certainly keep an eye on includes turbine generator, switch gear room, electrical penetrations and intake structure, and uh, no significant issues from that, uh, from that new inspection. Again, as mentioned on the 29th, we were back with a commissioner briefing uh, that also included drop-in meetings with uh, several of the senior NRC staff on the day before, and again, highlighting our commitment to returning the station to excellence, insights from the NRC inspections, uh, progress on the restart checklist, and uh, completed recovery work, and really from our perspective, what we saw as the path forward. Um, an NRC bi-quarterly exit meeting was held on June 3rd. Uh, that report will not contain uh, any findings of significance. Uh, with respects to upcoming inspections, and I'll highlight a few that have taken place since the beginning of June. We did have info out both last month and the uh, beginning of this month to help us uh, both overall with restart, um, as well as the training assist, again, as we focus on the training tool, as well as we got an accreditation visit uh, in November of this year. Uh, we did have baseline inspections for radiation protection, license renewal, uh, both again with the most significant issues identified. Uh, and then also we've had uh, a little bit larger team of about four inspectors uh, looking at high energy line break, environmental qualification, equipment service life, and follow up on a couple of the other restart checklist items. And uh, nothing preliminary from that team. That team will get a little bit larger and we'll be back uh, for a couple weeks in July uh, to follow up really on the remaining items that are uh, open on the checklist. Uh, NRC security inspection entered yesterday with uh, the four inspectors. Uh, expect that uh, expect that inspection to go well and recommendation for closure on uh, on the security findings. Um, as well as we've got uh, a smaller team taking a look at the final items on the uh, on the red finding. As mentioned, there's an ERO drill today, which is an all call drill for us, which I do get the pleasure of participating in. Uh, and that's in, that's in preparation. We've got an NRC graded exercise in August of this year. So again, as we're working on recovery items, it's important to sort of focus on you know the other items that we're doing. Whether we're talking security, emergency plan, I mentioned Fukushima, cyber security, you know, other industry initiatives that, uh, that we're maintaining our focus on. So the big picture, uh, we do stay focused on the safety um, and event-free uh, you know, recovery of the station, uh, safe and efficient restart, and just a couple of milestones that we talked about. I mentioned engineer, engineer safeguard features testing, which we did, a, we did an initial round in the February, March time frame. And that was primarily to do with uh, initial discovery, which we did find some items. Uh, but, but when we're at this point in time when we're doing engineer safeguards features testing, that means the majority, if not all, of the work on the safety systems is done. And we'll do that final testing sequence with the operators, as I mentioned, starting tonight. Um, there's less than 70 open items for paper items for core reload. Um, the big holds on core reload right now is primarily the containment internal structures, which I mentioned will be uh, in the NRC's hands on, on the 20th of this month, and a couple of smaller items. Uh, one of which I missed, one of which I mentioned, which is the, uh, the tornado missile protection uh, temporary modification work that will do in the intake structure. Uh, but the, when we get to engineered safeguards features testing, that just completes a, a large amount of paper closure for us, a large amount of retest uh, for the safety systems as we move forward. <coughs> One of the other items that was mentioned, and we've got face-to-face uh, -face discussion with inspectors this week, is the identification of post-restart commitments. And so we've gone through that exercise um, internally, challenged boards internally, of what the uh, you know what the remaining items from our perspective are for pre-restart across the manual chapter 350 checklist items, and what our commitments would be in those areas if necessary for post-restart, as well as items that are outside of that scope. And by that I mean items that you know, aren't just pure recovery, but are gaps to excellence that we will track. And, and what we will expect, I would say, from the NRC's perspective, is they'll look at you know, the, the myriad of, of plans that we have across those items, and, and, and they will select items that, uh, you know, that we'll be held accountable for in, in the regulatory process. So those face-to-face -face meetings start this week on site. Obviously, we've been sharing you know, actions across the manual chapter 350 items um, over, the past, uh, over the past couple of months. Uh, our continued uh, focus on li licensing and design basis. Uh, first series of training for, uh, for the entire engineering staff. In fact, we had the senior leadership team go through the same training. And you're going to see a, a continued focus on license and design basis uh, so that we're making good decisions today as we recover. Uh, we use the term the paper plant and the physical plant. And so a lot of work on the physical plant uh, as we've been uh, you know, recovering systems. Um, and then continued focus now on the paper behind it so the engineers have easily accessible tools to help us make good, whether it's design decisions or just technical decisions in the plant. 
Uh, additional focus, again, on the corrective action program and part of uh, the volume that, uh, that we're working on right now. And, and it really is uh, it really is department-dependent uh, help, again, uh, primarily the design engineering staff, where a lot of the technical questions go back to that department. And uh, so we're providing additional oversight and support, primarily the design uh, and engineering staff. And with that, uh, I'll open it up for, for questions and comments. How many open? How many open and closed uh, findings do we now have? I don't have the tally in front of me. The, um, if you look at across the, um, there's two ways to look at it, right? The manual chapter 350 checklist is what I kind of call the headlines. And then the NRC's inspection or basis document contains about 450 sub-items to inspect. Uh, we're 200 plus formally closed right now. And part of what we'll do with the NRC this week is sit down by line item and either understand what the status is, if it's open and closed, um, or if it's open, what is remaining, or if it's open, you know, is it open because it's a pre-restart or post-restart commitment? And that's the level of detail that we're working with the inspectors this week. And, and as a, in fact, uh, from the NRC's perspective, the, you know, we'll see the report that was mentioned in February come out later this month. And then the NRC will also, I believe, repost the manual chapter 350 checklist the basis document. <laughs> You know, with the updated closed item on there. Before the end of the month. Before the end of the month, and they'll put it on the website. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you'll see both of those from a, from a closed perspective. And then, like I said, you know, that's based on you know work that was done February, March, and so it's a, a considerable amount of work that's taken place since then. And we'll have that level of detail and granularity with uh, with, this, with the region. Uh, and we we do that on a you know twice a week basis, anyways. But uh, we'll, we'll have that face to face discussion. And has the NRC given you any idea about when the next other meeting will be? Tentatively in the July time frame. Uh, as I mentioned, we have two, uh, two weeks of fairly large inspection in the 9 to 10 inspector range in the middle of July. There's a third week that's kind of contingency on there. And then there's some smaller inspections that are either going to be parsed off to the resident inspectors or, or kind of you know, one-off inspectors. Very similar. Uh, last month we had one inspector doing the final closeout on a geotechnical issue. Uh, so, container control structures is another good example where there's <coughs> niche expertise that the NRC needs. So, um, we'll see all of the inspection activities wrap up in, uh, you know, in the middle of the July time frame is what is scheduled right now. And tentatively, it's not been public yet, but uh, looking towards the latter part of July for the next public meeting. <coughs> Any other questions for Lou? Okay, we'll go I was wondering how if Mo Dogman could give us an update on the corporate nuclear oversight activities and, and just to give us an update if he independently, you know, he and his team over that. Mm -hmm. sure, sure, I can do that. Uh, maybe I should take a minute or two just to kind of review again. what yeah. the process is and then we can uh, go through that later. Uh, we do have a nuclear oversight function at the Fort Camus station, and that consists of a department of about 20 people, and uh, we're led by a very seasoned uh, nuclear expert, Kerry Ian and uh, Gary and others know him. Uh, he's got over 30 years of, of experience. Uh, those uh, the 20 uh, employees, they're really also experts in their field, and what they do basically is uh, spend a lot of time in the field at the plant uh, monitoring, watching, evaluating, assessing, and at later dates even doing audits to ensure that whatever we're doing, whether it's uh, installing electric penetrations or uh, watching the behavior of the employees and, and what's going on, to make sure that, that we're doing everything up to standard and we're doing it safely. Uh, they also, once they, they do that, they provide a lot of feedback to the, uh, not only to the leadership at the uh, uh, team at Fort Calhoun, but also to the individual employees. So there is always an open communication on the spot. And those nuclear experts that are Port to Kiri and Kiri reports to me, and I'll talk about that in a minute here, uh, not only that they evaluate and monitor what's going on, they also have the authority to stop the work. If they see anything, that they don't believe it's right or they don't believe it's, it's appropriate, they do have the authority to stop the work. And uh, the station leadership and everybody there, uh, they have a, a 
tremendous confidence of, of nuclear oversight and there is a, a really strong relationship. Uh, so going back to Kerry Heenan, typically the manager of the nuclear oversight function reports to the chief nuclear officer, which would be Lou. But to ensure that uh, our president, uh, Gary Gates, and the board is given an independent uh, feedback, that function, Kerry Heenan reports to me, he does not, he does not report to Lou. Uh, so that uh, we believe it's very important. Not only we're doing uh, the evaluation and the inspection with a critical eye, and also I might want to add that the nuclear oversight uh, really looked at everything from that half-empty kind of a, a, a glass attitude. So not only we recognize all the good work that's been taking place, but we also focus on the, on the process and what we need to improve. So there's always that constant feedback positive but also a, 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 a critical feedback. Uh, so Terry you know, reports to me, I meet with Terry once a week and uh, I get that feedback and have a very open discussion. Terry also has a direct line to Lou and to the nuclear uh, to the nuclear leadership team. So he's always talking and, and providing feedback. And when I meet with Gary, I take that feedback also and provide that to Gary, to Lou, and also to Susan. So I also, as an independent corporate people oversight, I have a direct line to Gary. So Gary is getting an independent feedback, and you know that feedback that he's getting from me and from Lou does not align. Then we, we get together and meet, and we also meet once a week at least. Uh, in addition to the corporate people oversight. We also established a committee uh, we call uh, GOSS, that's Governance, Oversight, and, and Perform. And that committee consists of five uh, people. Uh, we have John Hansen from production, uh, very knowledgeable, very, very uh, experienced with the, with the bar plants. We also have from the regulation side, uh, uh, internal uh, to the plant, uh, Terry Simpkins. And we have uh, Kerry Enan, the Nuclear Oversight Manager. We also have uh, uh, Rich Howe, who's a, a senior consultant that works very closely with the group. We meet once a month, and we go over the very major <coughs> big items, and we, we discuss that openly and, and, and uh, frankly, and we provide a written report uh, to Gary, Lou, and Susan. And then once we provide that report, we get together and discuss the issues and make sure that we're all aligned on, on what, what needs to be done. Uh, so in, a, in summary, that's that's the process. Uh, but what I want to what I want to really underline the two things that we look at everything from a critical perspective and from independent perspective, just to make sure that our CEO is getting the independence uh, uh, feed, the independent feedback that he needs. Does that answer? That answers the question. So we are paying a little bit of attention and a little bit of back and forth, and as far as a double check. Correct. How do you think we're doing? Let's throw it into oversight. Uh, remember, I said we, we look at things from a critical point of view, but, but I think we're doing great. We've, we've done a lot of good work. Uh, we've accomplished a lot of the physical uh, work that we need to accomplish. I think the behaviors, the culture at Fort Calhoun is very strong. Uh, I think there is a tremendous commitment from all employees to do the right thing. Uh, so I, I believe, and, and the nuclear oversight uh, believes that we're doing a good job. We do have some areas that we need to close uh, and, and put behind us, and that's another thing that the nuclear oversight uh, experts do. They review all the closure books and make sure that when we say we're ready for the inspection for the NRC that we are. So there's, there's a, that constant feedback that's taking place not only every day, almost every hour. And I think you work seven days a week right now because of this. <laughs> so thank I think you. We're all working pretty hard. Everybody's working pretty hard here seven days a week. Yeah. Okay. Is, that a, is that a requirement that we have to do as an internal choice? So, so we'll get both. Uh, Director Gay, it is a requirement that we have independent people. So the structure, uh, the independence of the structure is uh, specific to us. You know, the fact that we've got an external operator. We used to have a separate we used to have a separate star committee, but this is on top of it. So it's more independence.
Yeah, the SARP has transitioned now to the MSRB. And the SARP, uh, right. The Excellent. That's the role independent oversight through the MSRB and what they call MRM management reviews, which uh, they provide another level of the oversight. And then, I you know there's a lot of eyes on this thing now, yeah, but is uh, down the road, how do you get to be on a committee like that that is not too comfortable? Does it change a little bit? Or I know you can't change a lot because the expertise needed to, to know what's going on. But instead of just, you know, after a few years down the road, you go good. You have to I rotate, you have to rotate yeah. membership. And 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 so we'll put together a succession plan and we'll work with his team on how to rotate the independents. So there's not a familiarity piece. Yeah. Yeah, we have to go through that on a controlled basis. So we have, have, we have right. people that have continuity and that we have to look your eyes and all the Small we've been out uh, for two years now. Using a baseline of 2011, what's, how would you assess the morale of these employees out there? Given what they've been through? Yeah. Great question. And, and we, you know, all of us have, have been involved uh, since the flood, and, and I think uh, what we've seen, the morale is kind of different, and now we're really, we're, we're way up. Uh, we were just talking about that two weeks ago, that uh, when we go to the plant and, and walk around and talk to engineers and electricians and, and uh, management, uh, I think the morale is, is, is as good as, as I've seen it in the last uh, year or so. So I, I think it's pretty good. I think people see that we've made a lot of progress. Uh, we've, we've got a lot of work done, and, and that uh, gives us a lot of trust and a lot of confidence that we're getting close. The, uh, that's, there's some external data points on that too. Both our CPAs and the Negative Mosque were specific and national and now kind of interface with the employees. Director, or uh, Commissioner Mayhew, and that with our young generation professionals. And I uh, spent over an hour, I think, with them. This is with them. <coughs> Had a very positive meeting. It was very complimentary for them. The new generation. I can say that too. Some of the young professionals are getting very positive. I think all But it just as a very practical operational question. Are, are the uh, people out there still able to take their vacations, uh, that kind of thing? Or? I think it's been challenging, but I think Blue and the leadership team is working for that, and I think they're providing a lot of opportunities <coughs> to make sure that these concerns are, are taken care of. Since we're in a startup right now, I'm going to say probably if you have the ability to do it for the next step, for the startup, you're going to have the ability to do it. You sort of want to have the schedule, right? Yeah. So that's a little different. Yeah. Well, we have to do it as much as possible, but obviously, if they're not as well, we've got to do it as well. The new reporters in the committee that got over Memorial Day, they, yeah. they went out of their way to make sure as many people got the chance to have three days before the weekend as possible. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Sorry, this kind of thing. Yeah, we do. Any other questions from all? Well, good. Hope uh, our, our next uh, board meeting is the next three weeks, and uh, hopefully we'll have a much clearer picture of where we are. And uh, Gary, can you give us a... We plan on doing a more detailed report to July board meeting, not only this issue, but uh, the other, if it's a good change, um, a broader report, a mid-year report. A mid-year report. A mid -year report. Uh, yeah, on so everything, say everything, we think it would be appropriate to do that, so we'll plan on that. Very good. Thank you very much. We'll move on to finance and work together. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have two items on the board items that we're reporting on. Uh, the items we'll be voting on Thursday uh, is our annual uh, health, the district health care plan. In 1981, the board of directors authorized the formation of a self funded administrative services only health plan. Health plan includes the health insurance programs and the health program also funds it. Health plan is subject to the political subdivision self funding benefits act. In order to comply with the act, the district is required to prepare this <coughs> report and health plan is required to preserve. 2012, the act of the entire medical, dental, pharmacy, and administrative fees totaled $62 million. Employee and corporate contributions and subscription reduced the expenses of $35 million. This is the employees contributed to the second level for the fund. This is a 4% increase in 2011, and the lower marketplace on the Tuesday, and that's probably 8%.
the unrestricted cash balance for the at the end of May was two hundred fifty five point one million dollars, which is about fifty three million dollars over budget. Cash balance excludes fifteen point four million dollars of restricted Nebraska City Two participant funds. Remember uh, a, a, a fairly rough rule of thumb uh, uh, to try to figure to compare the amount of money we have on hand based upon numbers of days operating uh, revenue of the bank is about a million dollars a day. So we're looking at approximately Bill did not move ahead this year. 
I spoke to this Senator Mello, and he has intentions of continuing to move that bill next year, but 104 did move ahead. And um, I think we're evaluating right now, because it might have some potential benefit to the district. You know, that Steve. We do have benefit. Okay. And we're calculating and figuring mm -hmm. out uh, how much that might be. It's subject to a confidentiality clause, Director McGuire, but I'd be happy to uh, okay. provide the details. Tom, um, uh, the, the party chambers haven't been in the chamber in this in the past. The in 402? I mean, they haven't been in the legislature. Because wasn't this the one where he, uh, or was it on the other? It's 104 one? where he basically. Uh, added a, an amendment striking the city of Omaha's ability to enact a local sales tax option. It struck me as a central chamber. Uh, there, was, there was more politics that went on involved in that than the Senator Chambers. I think that also, um, the governor probably wasn't supportive of the 104 when it was originally introduced and with the addition of the elimination of the sales tax in Omaha uh, changed his mind. Um, LB's 405 and 406. Um, those bills are going to turn into an interim study uh, through, and I'll speak about it when I get to the interim studies, but basically if those bills were enacted, they would have cost the district about $1.7 million. If you look at our sales tax exemption on coal, nuclear fuel, and our power purchases. And I'll come back for these two when I get to the interim study. Hey, Tom, can I just uh, you know, make a point here? I think one of the concerns here is um, because we tax uh, customers on bills, the sales tax, the concern from the utility industry is that you're really double taxing the consumer. So you're taxing on the purchase of coal or any fuels that you're using to generate, and you're taxing them on the sale of that product, which includes the cost of that coal and fuel. So the concern that the industry has is that you're really double taxing the consumer or at least on the sub-product of, of, of that, and that's been a concern of the industry. We're taxing the input to the outcome of our business. And, um, traditionally, that has not been the tax policy in the state of Nebraska. Um, 583. 583 is a provision related to membership of the Climate uh, Response Committee. Senator Carr introduced this bill. It's a uh, been directed uh, state appropriate $50,000. It's going to be conducted by the uh, University of Nebraska at Lincoln. It changes the membership of the Climate and Response Committee to uh, a couple of uh, different uh, engineering and, and meteorologicals, in other words, people who have a background in climate uh, investigation. And uh, that went through towards the end of the session. And the last bill, as you're all aware, is the bill about uh, changing uh, the structure of districts of OPP's board. Um, I know that's continuing to be looked at and discussed about how we're going to move forward with that. Questions on that before? It was a busy year, uh, a time of stressful year, but uh, as an industry we were fairly successful. Uh, we continue to make strides in renewable development and that continues to be a forefront of discussion in the Nebraska legislature. We were debating energy issues up until the last day of the bill. There were many bills. It's, it's went as long as I've seen it go in the 20 years I've been doing it, right up to the last day. Um, the interim studies. I don't, you do not have this one in your packet. I mean, because it's relatively new. Just to give you a brief understanding of what some of the interim studies will be tracking. There's the Tax Equalization and Modernization Committee. That's where the exemptions that we have for the coal and nuclear power purchases the NPA, the Nebraska Power Association, will be involved in that early on, provide a position statement to the tax committee about the industry's position on um, input or taxing inputs to get to an output. Uh, there's another bill that uh, looks at incentives and the processes that the state has to go through to give the wind incentives. Senator Carr has an interim study to examine that. Senator Smith has a bill to look at the generation mix of utilities in Nebraska from coal and nuclear including renewables. And this will be a fairly comprehensive discussion on it. And, and to, be able, to be quite honest, he led a lot of the discussion on the floor this year uh, about energy. He's a former employee of OPD. He understands energy issues. While they agreed with him at times, at times disagreed with him. But it was a 
probably a more spirited debate on energy mix than I've seen in a long time. Um, the last couple deal with um, Senator Har has a, an interim study to examine. Senator Har has a uh, Ken Har has a theory that you can plug renewable, small renewable energy projects, wind development, into the transition system. And he is working with uh, the Southwest Power Pool. He, he, he's not afraid to contact them, get information, check things out, trying to figure out a way to develop small renewable projects in the state of Nebraska. Uh, eminent domain, in the Keystone Pipeline, we continue to have discussions as other political subdivisions in the state of Nebraska do dealing with eminent domain, that will be an interim study as well. Uh, a study to look at inter, uh, net metering. There are people who want to expand kilowatt hours. That would be um, uh, under the purview of uh, net metering. People want to go from 25 kW to 100 kW. 100 kW is a pretty good size load. 25 kW would be a small farm and an operation. But there are people who are pressing ahead and wanting to look at an expanded uh, view of that. And I guess lastly is Senator Haar wants to examine the statutory requirements of the Power Review Board and some of the approval processes that we go through as utilities to get generation and transmission. Last thing I'd like to speak with you about is what we're going to do during the interim. There will be a, a major effort by the Nebraska Power Association to continue to educate the legislature about electric utility industry issues this has caused um, a, a, a steeper curve in educating people on these issues. It used to be you had eight or ten years to figure out how to get this all figured out. Now you have one, and you hit the ground running, and you got to go. So we'll be doing a lot of work in that area. And from my perspective here in OPGD, we have a series of leadership community meetings we're going to do, um, discussing different topics of interest to local leaders and state senators. And lastly, working together to put some tours of our facilities together in an effort to educate senators and legislators and community leaders about our efforts and how we operate. Questions for me? Uh, Tom, there was a uh, uh, LD that got some publicity from Senator Lathrop that was passed by the governor on the sales tax exemption for wind projects. That's LB 104. Okay, 104. Uh, does that have any impact for with OPPD? That's the one where Steve was commenting that there's a conflict. I think there's a positive impact for OPPD. The details of that are covered by a confidentiality agreement in the contract with the developers to win. That's why I'm reluctant to say too much about it. Steve's looking at it. You know, maybe okay. I think what's really important about that, I think, is we see other states around us, including Kansas and Iowa who offer similar kinds of sales tax exemptions for the purchase of equipment to build wind farms. Um, Nebraska uh, has, has moved another step in being competitive with other wind farm development in Iowa and Kansas, and that's positive, I think. And those, that benefit will come back to us with the intent of lower wind purchase agreement rates. That, that benefit so. us with our last wind project um, with the, this is a Fraser Strider, so yeah. we, we were able to capture some things in that last project. That's going to definitely will help in the future. And in the future as well. And our model is that we don't directly build the projects, we purchase the power, so it's structured in the contracts. <coughs> and the competition, we hope that we uh, actually get out. That's, that's the same level. level. That's, where that, that's where they're going with that. So, um, directly, yeah. I, I got a question. I'm glad to hear you say about the turnover and it is a big job you've got now. Well, it has been but now more so and it's very complex in business that you guys but as you say that maybe all these people are running, I mean, are you out and about or I mean budgeted for this that you can go because the guy out in Scott's Bluff can be just the biggest problem with the guy in Omaha that doesn't know what's we really going on. we really do have a coordinated effort primarily with the Nebraska Power Association because um, because you even get into kind of rural and urban kind of issues on the power side as well. But it's important for them to hear kind of both sides of it because at the legislature, you know, it may not necessarily impact a, a, an REC somewhere out in the panhandle, but it does impact MPPD and OPPD as generators uh, on some issues. So the NPA will have a kind of a full blown, uh, which will include not just our legislative folks, but other operating folks, other tours of other facilities across the state. Absolutely. Say your letters. Absolutely.
And then as an NOPPD, I'm, I'm giving the flexibility to do those things as well. So it's, it goes well. If there are no other questions, I'll see you in less further directed, I'll see you next January. <laughs> <laughs> so we can do the things that we talked about. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Lisa Olson and, and Russ Baker have uh, essentially are leading our strategic initiative around the development of a stakeholder process and uh, we're here to give an update and we briefed the public information committee yesterday on kind of the status of that and so uh, Lisa will kind of give the presentation and um, kind of tell you where we are in that process, where we're going to go and uh, it's, it's, some, it's some good news. We're having some good, uh, good feedback uh, from a lot of our consumers. I'll turn over Lisa. Great. Great. And Russ has copies if you'd like them as well. So uh, we're going to tag team this. So um, some of you have seen a lot of me lately uh, talking about this. And one of the great things about leading marketing and communications is you can make sure that you can communicate effectively both with internal and um, external audiences. So internally, um, we call this the Initiative 6A. Uh, Russ and I have been. Uh, living this for the last uh, several months as well as some representation with the um, um, some team members within the company which uh, Tom is part of that as well so with that basically what we wanted to do was find a comprehensive process that will provide a framework for stakeholder engagement and the goal is to build trust with customer owners effectively manage complex communications on projects and initiatives to promote the value that we place on stakeholder relationships one of the other great benefits about leading marketing and communications is in terms of positioning and so forth. Um, we have tagged this campaign OPPD Listens, and it has really resonated with our customers um, and stakeholders um, across our 13 counties. So with that, um, we started this initiative, um, oh gosh, uh, January I guess it was, and we're on a fast track really to present it to you in the August um, board meeting, and we wanted to give you an update for where we're at. What I want to talk about is, you know, OPD has done a really good job over the years in terms of a stakeholder engagement. Um, when it came to transmission line planning, substation location identification, community involvement, and outage communications, etc. And this was a process really that we utilized with the help of HDR. And Teresa's here, she, she's been instrumental with that over the years. So what we wanted to do with this is build off of the good work that we've done. So this is really what it looks like today. And this, these are some of the ideas of what it could look like. Um, I'm a walker, sorry. <laughs> um, in, in the future, we could use it for uh, facility siting changes, urgent communications. We used this during the flood and got kudos even from um, uh, the governor and so forth talking about how we really were that communication vehicle for a lot of the communities. Um, I lead our products and services on the residential side, so we can use this really to test really fun rebates and, and incentives. And you'll, you'll hear some really interesting feedback that we heard from the rural areas as well. Community programs, new products and services, customer account updates, regulatory initiatives, and the list goes on. During the open houses that I'll be talking about, this is a chance where the public's going to really be able to take an iPad or even a uh, traditional piece of paper and talk through. What do they want to know about? When do they want to get engaged? Um, and so this this part will be um, part of the open houses coming up. Okay, so let's just recap. Phase one really was in the um, January, February, March, April, and in May timeframe. What we finished up is the benchmark study, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The stakeholder workshops. Um, we're just finishing up the uh, investor and industrial um, surveys, and then the management review. So let's get to to the update. You probably heard me talk about, um, you know, when we started this, we really wanted to find some um, industries that do it well. Not just utilities, but really um, utilities and uh, businesses across the United States. And so we worked with HDR to identify those. And we picked uh, five of them right here. So Portland, it was uh, the Metropolitan Regional Planning uh, Agency. It was interesting because they have a wide range wide array of um, services that they provide uh, their stakeholders. The City of Austin and Austin Energy. Nashville Electric, we had the opportunity to talk to their CEO, which was a, a good talk. And then we also wanted to talk about the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers because we, Russ and the team, we all work very closely with them, and especially during the flood. So what we wanted to talk about was 
lessons learned for them and, and <coughs> see if they have a formalized stakeholder process. This was an aha moment for me and Russ, maybe for you too. Um, with that, it was interesting because they do have a robust um, program. It's just not communicated well. So the, the good part is they're watching us on how this works and really are going to probably uh, model some of the things that we're doing with that. So, so with that then, the next phase was the workshops. Um, and you heard about this. We split it up into um, six zones. Um, and we had six workshops across the district um, in the May time frame. As you know, we were in Tecumseh, Louisville, Papillion, Omaha, Ashland, and Blair. I don't know about, uh, well, I can't talk to Russ, but Russ, we had some great information. Now I'll tell you about what we heard, which we wanted to, to give you feedback on that. So, what did we hear? Um, I would say over 80% of all the participants in uh, those workshops said OPBD is doing a phenomenal job. Um, they love having people in the community, they're responsive, um, but as we all know, you can't let that, um, as we say, go to our head. Um, we gotta keep moving forward with that. So the other things that we heard was more proactive outreach on current issues and decision making is desired. Let me just give you just a simple um, context for that. In one of our Louisville um, workshops, a customer said, he goes, you know, I love OPPD and I know who comes to my house and so forth, but I came home and there was an individual that was working in my front yard and there was a transmission line that was down. He said, I would have loved to have some proactive communication on that um, to let me know that you were going to be working in my area and so forth. So those are the things that we do, but maybe we could do it a little bit better. So we're going to be incorporating that. During these workshops, we made sure that we had traditional customers, we had young customers, um, we had um, a, a wide array. So what we heard loud and clear is new and improved tools and uh, digital engagement sh uh, should be included. That was music to my ears as a, as a communicator. So these are the things that they want us to build. Um, an online survey panel, that's something um, I lead market research and an online sur survey panel will be very beneficial for this company, especially for products and services. We can use that as a um, go-to really focus group on a yearly basis. They'll be together for a whole year and we can socialize issues to say, you know what, um, we're thinking about um, adding this new product and services. Is that something that you would trust OPPD to do for? Or is it something that you would feel like maybe somebody else needs to be doing? Or maybe what we want to do is socialize <laughs> Maybe we have um, our customer service hours. Maybe we <coughs> go to an eight hour or you know specific times. We can socialize that. So what will be nice about that, we're going to go ahead and implement that um, in 2014. Increased use of smartphone applications. They love our mobile apps. Um, we love our mobile apps in terms of outreaches and so forth. So are there things that we can build in terms of um, outreach that we can communicate um, with, with our customers on a time, more timely basis? We currently use social media, which I'm, I'm proud of the company for taking that step. Um, they, they like to increase the use of social media, and so we'll, we'll definitely be um, having a more robust communication effort on that. And loud and clear, I don't know about you, but I use my text messaging nonstop, so that was something that we heard as well. Um, talking um, and uh, overlaying what Tom was talking about, um, more education on public power is needed. Our traditional uh, customers, they understand the benefits of public power. I think some of our younger generation, um, um, we could do some more um, education on that, so we'll build that into the process as well. And then from our internal interviews, we heard internal engagement is important. If we're gonna build these uh, tools for the outside, let's go ahead and build them for the inside so we're talking the same language in terms of transparency. Stakeholders should be regularly updated with regulatory, operational, and generation impacts of our rates. No surprise. Um, with that, so we'll, we'll continue the effort and um, take that to the next level as well. Engagement offers, um, efforts should be extended beyond projects or initiatives. They talked about um, our transmission lines and substation efforts, really think it's great. So they're asking for this process to figure out what, what would be the um, examples of that. Use of traditional and innovative methods of outreach and um, as we talked about, in fact, we had some of our customers bring their outlets with them. Um, these are in all of our, our uh, billing and so forth. 
So that part was really great. I, I uh, conveyed that back to the team. Stakeholders should be empowered to engage in OPPD decision making. This was really interesting. This came from the Papillion um, workshop. Um, a gal said, she goes, you know what, now that I know that I'm going to have that voice, it's my responsibility to continue to keep feeding that so that it will help you make those decisions. Um, okay, rural and urban needs and expectations should be considered uniquely. No surprise um, there, and, and I absolutely love these workshops, um, getting out to um, the rural areas as well. What they were talking about there is some of our products and services, um, we offer, you know, rebates and so forth, and for like IHAP, we have certain um, installers that help with that. Well, let's look at doing that in the rural areas as well. Or, as you can tell on some of my outfits, um, we've got some couponing and so forth on the back. Let's go ahead and do some targeted marketing for some of the rural areas and engage some of our uh, <coughs> partners in those rural areas as well. So I'm excited about that opportunity as well. Detailed status of operations should be readily available. They talked a lot about OPPD, and I'll probably be back uh, with you uh, in a few months. We are revamping OPPD.com. That's something that we've been wanting to get to. It's been five years since we've um, worked through that, so I'm, I'm really <coughs> excited about that opportunity. Um, stakeholders should be educated regarding demand side management options. No, no surprise there. So we're just going to increase those efforts. And stakeholders should be educated regarding future portfolio planning and so forth. No surprises there. Russ, anything you want to add? No, I think you've already mentioned something. Lisa, how, how, how were the, uh, the groups assembled? In other words, was it just an open meeting, or did you specifically no, invite people? Actually, what we did was we went through and we wanted to make sure that it was a nice mix. We didn't want it too big and so forth, so we included local residents. Okay, uh, uh, customers, commercial and industrial customers, elected officials, or, uh, and communication was extended to them, non governmental agencies, and advocate, advocacy uh, organizations. So, like, what would be the size of the group? Oh, it ranged anywhere from maybe 15 to 25. Our North Omaha one was probably our largest. Okay. In fact, I think you participated in that one. So, yes. any feedback? Um, Oh, I, I like some, some of the points you, I'm sorry, you, don't, you really don't want me to go into that. I apologize. I'll direct your mind. I think you don't want to hear the answer. I think one of the things that we wanted to look at is that we had these government organizations that we deal with all the time, yeah. um, and that we cooperate with, that good partnership with, and then we have these kind of non government organizations, which includes the Brassens for Peace and the Sierra Club. and. Uh, the Nebraska Wildlife Federation, and it kind of goes on and on and on, the Omaha Green Coalition and others. Uh, and we kind of got all of those together in a room to begin to give that feedback about the stakeholder process look like. So um, it, it wasn't, uh, it was meant to be really open and broad, mm -hmm. you know, and objective. So, okay. okay. And actually, we asked, and like, Teresa facilitated um, a lot of those. And the reason we wanted that is because we wanted to be neutral and, and let them do their business. It was hard for Russ and I to be on the sidelines uh, and not want to interject a little bit more. So. They wouldn't let me yeah. attend. So uh, imagine that. <laughs> that would be something for me not to. I know. It was <laughs> too. So. One, you know, one of the criticisms that we did receive was the fact that I think a lot of uh, a lot of the attendees wanted to actually get into a topic or an initiative or a project, and and what we're really trying to do with this is to find the process that we can then use for those initiatives and projects and that. So so maybe you know trying to keep those separated was, was maybe a Probably little bit of a challenge, but, but hopefully by the end of the workshops we convince mm -hmm. people that this is about a process, not about a topic. But but we really do want your input to make it better. Um, we also um, took the opportunity if people had um, issues from a T and D standpoint or something, we gathered those. Uh, came back to the business unit and most group and everybody was really great. We got back to them within 24 hours. So people have commented on that. Okay, let's talk about phase two. Um, next is going to be our, oh, let, let, me, let me back up. One of the things that we learned here from the benchmarking is that there's got to be um, the rules of, of engagement. Um, what, what are the rules really for the district? And then what are the rules really for the stakeholders? Um, and 
we're going to be highlighting this during the open house as well. So that was something that we felt like we needed to have it really um, front and center for us. So here's a framework that we came up with as we listened, and we're going to be coming back and confirming and, and verifying. This is going to be our constant roadmap, okay? We're always going to plan, implement, and measure. These are the things that are going to provide us the flexibility and the depth. We're going to decide, really, how deep do we want to go on, on issues and so forth. For instance, if it's uh, talking about rates or uh, resource generation and so forth, those are the things that we'll probably bring the entire tool kit out for, okay? But if it's talking about maybe changing customer service hours and so forth, we may just use the online panel to socialize that. So, like I said, these are the things that are always going to be constant during this process. So at the end, and the team's tired of hearing me say this, what's fair and equitable for all of our rent payers and customers? So what's going to happen is, and through all of this process, or whatever, we're going to bring to senior management and to the board, this is what we heard from the customers, and then that will help you make your decisions uh, moving forward. Okay, the next two weeks are going to be really exciting. Um, we are starting our media blitz. In fact, I told Aaron about this. We'll be issuing a press release after this, talking about all of these open houses. Um, sure hope that uh, the board members will mark this on some of your calendars. In fact, for us, hand it out um, a flyer for that so that you'll have that at your fingertips and so forth. Um, looking forward to, we really try to make sure that we divvy up the entire um, districts and so forth. And then we're going to um, do this in North Omaha um, on July 1st. We also noted that we wanted to do sometime over the lunch hour, sometimes early evenings. We have Saturdays as well. So if people can't really come to uh, one, they'll have an opportunity. But in regard to that, let's, let's move on here. They're also going to be able to go to OPPD Listens. This is 24 hour, okay? They can take the survey or they can join an online open house that's going to be open until July 2nd to participate. So they don't even have to go home to come to an open house. They can participate online. And this website is live. You can get to it by OPPD Listens as well as OPPD.com. How are you advertising that right now? That's just Actually, um, uh, we'll issue a press release and then we're going to uh, do a follow-up media blitz on that and okay. reach out to all of that. And then we're also doing um, some small advertisements in the local newspapers and so forth all across the districts, um, inviting people to attend. So, as a recap, let me go back and let you know where we're at. April, we did the benchmarking. We conducted the uh, workshops during March. We've been updating senior management all along. We're going to be, uh, we drafted up the process that we talked about. Uh, we confirmed, verify, and incorporated the change. And now what we're going to do is go to the public and say, this is what we heard. Is this exactly really what you want? Um, and then what we're going to do is in July, you're going to have that opportunity as well um, to participate because we want to get um, your input on that. And then in August, we'll come to you with a final proposal. And you can decide next steps. Questions, comments? Did I stay within my allotment? You were. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> volume and velocity. Oh, yeah. was just for oh, yeah. <laughs> if you don't lease it, the volume doesn't change, the velocity might. So <laughs> <laughs> you may speed through it. I, I, I get one question or a comment. So as you go on through this, and I don't know, and this could be taken into account, but we're just going to do more. Sometimes when you get like bombarded with things, you start even bring it. But I like the idea of a service so in my neighborhood or sure. pertinent and pertinent things. <clears throat> Otherwise, there's so many social media bombarding. Yeah. yeah, how do we, uh, we don't have an answer now, I'm just saying it's a concern to me if we didn't start advertising like, oh my God, I'm not going to Yeah. Overkill. Well, that's, uh, that's why we're going to ask the customers that information. <laughs> that's <laughs> what, what's overkill, what's right. Now, I will share with you, we've done a couple things on some homeowners association Facebook sites oh. on outages, which is kind of interesting. And the feedback has been very positive. Now, that's a, quite a commitment to get on every homeowners association Facebook site, specifically if there's an outage that are tying it back to how can we respond to that Facebook site where people may be saying, it's kind of funny because when you go on some of them, uh, I, you know, I use Leewood Oaks and my subdivision is one, one example where we're having some power quality kinds of things, um, 
And, and it was really interesting what people were saying. I typically don't go to my homeowners association, but, but what a lot of people do on the Facebook side. So there's a lot of people saying a lot of different things, but when you got in there and gave them facts, and then what we were doing to try to correct the situation, it changed the whole demeanor and tone of what was going on on that homeowner association Facebook site. So that is one extreme that we may look at doing, but we'll let the customers tell us what's the right level <coughs> of volume and some of those kinds so of things. For, yeah, so for each like, generation two, there's a couple of purposes. I don't get everything, but yeah, so just to keep up on that has to be hard. Well, and what's great about this is it's not a one and done. As you can tell from this, it is a constant cycle and so forth. And uh, like I said, I'm excited to be in the marketing so communications. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Lisa, Rachel, what are your expectations from these public meetings? What, what do you expect to, to gain from them? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting through all of this, people are saying, I love seeing OPD people. I mean, that, as I tell our employees, we are the brand. And this is the chance for people to come in, just see what OPD is doing. It's going to be very informal. They can come through as a poster board session okay. as well. Um, we're going to have a representative from TNB there. We're going to have um, from economic development. The faces of the community um, are going to be there. So it's going to be more of a um, community relations, but also a chance for them to build what's on their mind and decide where they want to opt in for, what don't they want, and we're really listening. It, it, it's really to also kind of ascertain on the, on the public um, workshops that we did and begin to list the things that people believe we ought to use the stakeholder process for. Uh, are we um, as, as deep or as wide and as deep as we should be on issues and what's that look like? And, and then um, it begin to then execute it. And so we may go to these people who attended the workshops because we'll have their information and say, hey, we want you to be part of our online panel because we're gonna do a new online bill presentment and we want you to give us feedback. Uh, and we did that when we first started that. People typically were complaining that we didn't have an online payment mechanism online, right? So we used the people, we kept their emails that were complaining about it and then we went to them and said, so we're going to set up a dummy site, you go in, you give us feedback, and we made changes based on that customer feedback, and we told them what changes we made. And so it's all part of that kind of communication process that we are going to engage with customers probably more often and on more different things than we ever have. My only criticism might be at the times, uh, you have to be retired or self-employed to attend these, 11 to 1 o'clock, yeah. uh, 4 to 6 perhaps, but uh, yeah, I know in the communities I represent, uh, you're not going to get the variety of stakeholders that you would get okay. if it were six to eight. Okay. okay. You did a great workshop in the Blair area yeah. as well. So, um, the rest of the office was closing down in City Hall, and so we stayed okay. and, and had a great day. Well, and maybe that's something that we can actually begin to talk about. It. Is, there, mm -hmm. is there a better time? If, and I guess what we'll find out um, if director Mines is that if we begin these and we don't get a lot of participation, we may make some changes okay. um, as we go through that and, uh, and make that expansion. So adjust. we will. We'll we'll get to see what that looks like. Now we did. We have done these on the transmission substation side, yeah. and I think some of the directors would know we get a lot of participation mm -hmm. in yeah. that four yeah. 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 uh, and in that new. But it's really it's really different. Yeah. But, um, uh, anyway, okay. we'll, we'll, we'll take that into consideration at a good point. Thanks for the feedback. Yep. So, my, my grandchildren will tell you that you also need to get cleaning up there in Instagram. Okay. Because it's all changing. You guys have a good Twitter. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, I can't do Instagram. I'm sorry. So, we might have a normal presentation of these things. Can they comment on each of your boards? Is that what you're doing? There's a big area or something that are real funny.
two board items and two information items. First board item is to purchase a 15 kV metal clad switchgear from the substation 6815. Uh, that's uh, required for the work that's associated with the profit and uh, it includes also service then on the new strike down building. We received six proposals. Three were legally and technically responsive. Uh, the engineer's estimate for this project is $675,000. We had uh, four bids that complied legally, and the best price of those was Harold to the Schultz Company, and so we were asking for action at the board meeting to authorize the awarding of the contract to that company in the of $749,000 for the purchase of this item. Any questions on that? If not, I'll move on to the second item. Uh, this is to purchase two uh, 33 MBA transformers. Uh, these will be used at the uh, new OPD substations at uh, uh, 123rd and uh, high, Highway 50 and also at 184 Blondo. Uh, ten proposals were received, four are technically and legally responsive. The engineer's estimate for this contract is $1,270,000. And we're asking that this contract be awarded to CG Power System USA Incorporated in the amount of one million two hundred thirty-one thousand two hundred dollars. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, the next item is for Russian professional services for project management, engineering procurement, right-of-way, material and construction management, and environmental. <clears throat> this is for uh, professional services that are associated with the Midwest Transmission Project, Nebraska Transmission, a part of that, or MTP-NT, and Line 58 slash 71 project. This was advertised for bid on April 5th, 2013. This deals with the Nebraska portion of the new 2345 KV line from Nebraska City to Kansas City that will give us increased capacity and reliability. Uh, this will run from substation uh, 963 at Brock, Nebraska to NPPD Cooper Station. Uh, and it, uh, six proposals were received. The engineer's estimate uh, was six and a half million dollars. We were recommending that it be awarded, uh, the contract for these professional services be awarded to HDR for a total amount of seven million one hundred ninety-six thousand twenty-nine dollars, which was the lowest in the best bid. Any questions on that? Hey, a question. Uh, well, can you give us an update on the time frame of all this? When do you think the lines are going to go in and completion? And the short, the short team 15, <coughs> complete by June 17, 2017. Wow. Yeah, the line should be uh, should be in service by June of uh, 2017. Uh, should be constructed and completed by the end of 2016. And uh, construction will begin in 2015. We're pretty close to finalizing the route, and uh, that will be uh, that will be communicated here in the week or two. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so this is both for a, a new, the new portion of the 345 is all new. Correct. That's and then we're going to rebuild the the line 691 for Brock to <coughs> a complete rebuild. Correct. Yeah, from, from Rock to Cooper. How many miles is that? Uh, so the line from uh, Nebraska City to uh, to Sibley, Missouri, our portion would be about 45 miles. To the and the one from Brock to Cooper is not It's not that far, yeah. But, but that's, uh, that's been on, on our radar screen to improve and get further. And on the Missouri side, how long is that line? That's, that's close okay. uh, to like 200. Yeah, they've got a lot on the line, and they're the ones who are really in the process. Yeah, we're working very closely with that, basically. Any 
other questions on that? I, I may want to add, that's a part of the uh, Southwest Power Pool uh, uh, project. And uh, we, you know, the whole member uh, membership, all members of the uh, SCP will be paying for this line. Our, our portion is only about 5%. And for export of wind, if that is Nebraska's eventual goal, this is a critical part of that. Is that yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that will include the grid and include that, that transfer of power. Yeah, so, so what you just said, the professional services is contracted $7 million. So that's going to go into the SPP bill? Is that it? Or yeah, the whole cost. Will the be, whole yeah. cost goes the SPP bill. Right. And in we'll, the end, we pay 5% of what that entire project we'll, is. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll have to pay for the whole thing, and we'll be collecting that. All we'll collect it later. Any other questions? If not, uh, I'll try to cover in a succinct and pretty way the <laughs> purchase orders. Uh, <laughs> but they're awfully expensive. <laughs> they're half a million or more. Um, first one is for uh, to allow the district to run our rail car fleet through the shop for inspection and maintenance. Second one is with uh, Westinghouse Electric Company, uh, as you see, for fire protection support, transit te testing, and analyzation of loss of power condition during flooding with the National Fire Protection Association. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, third one is with uh, Stevenson Associates. It's for professional services to uh, perform additional analysis of containment. Uh, for internal structures as well as equipment as built, walk down inspection and review. Uh, fourth one is for tornado protect protection that deals with uh, analyzing safety related structures to ensure protection from a tornado and along with uh, seismic analysis of hybrid systems. The next one is for uh, uh, containment <coughs> penetration speed through assemblies. Uh, F or 6 is for uh, air operated valve maintenance and testing support. And the last one is to provide services for engineering association assurance group to provide uh, engineering products such as design and licensing basis. And those last six were all with their four thousand cost. That's correct. Right. Yeah. That ends the report, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Director Green and Douglas, uh, we've got some in, we've been going to private uh, session, closed session, but we also have some in the Yeah, okay. Do you want to read that? I do. Um, two things. One is, uh, we have been working on the uh, District reorganization is required by the legislature. And I um, want to bring it to the board in the July committee and for the uh, July board, which is a meeting. And I would like, to, if you haven't had a chance to stop up at, in the director's office and take a look at what we're talking about, uh, <coughs> please do so. And then I'll put the next month up and call it see how you put your feelings are and try to get a consensus and then go with that. Uh, the other one is, is that um, uh, we prepared to review some what we would call guidelines for public participation at the board meetings. And uh, we have checked with other uh, utilities and uh, public bodies in the area and then everybody seems to have one except us. So uh, what you have in front of you is uh, something that we've, with the assistance of council, we've drafted, uh, which uh, takes a lot from uh, the NPPD means guidelines, which are published on their website. So uh, if there's no great uh, objection or wanting to lay this over, uh, my thought was that we just, if everyone's in comfortable, that we just go ahead and put it on the board and have a public discussion and, vote at that time uh, for this. It's just be a board operating resolution rather than anything else. Similar to what we're already doing. Well, yeah, it's what we're doing, but it lays it out to the public so that they know. 
So that if you know, all of a sudden somebody gets cut off, they don't okay. feel that they're being picked on the July meeting. No, I'm talking about uh, there's no reason not to do it on Thursday unless anybody unless you want to wait over the July. And is this is this on the uh, internet so people have seen it? <coughs> the it, it, would, it would be. I mean, if it was going to be on the agenda, I think we have 24-hour notice yeah, to put it on the agenda okay. for Thursday. Yeah, I just think just so everybody could look at it ahead of time. You know, sure really sure 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 yeah. 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 No, I, I ask if the resolutions had to be on a structured agenda. Well, well sure. Yeah. But but they can they can be changed up 24 hours to 23 hours, which is what Mr. Burke was saying. Yeah. Yeah, it, to me it seems similar to what we're already doing and asking for, you know, the three right. minutes. Right, just, just, just find a little structure to it. Yeah. Just put yeah. a little structure to it, and then we can put it on yeah. our, our website as their review can take out. Just, would we really have to even go on this? Yes. As a board operating list. Is it support operating list? Okay. And this time. Okay. Uh, everybody comfortable with that? No comment notice? Okay. Uh, uh, I need, this says I'm going to do this. So I'm going to the board going to close session at this time. Nine, uh, okay. <laughs> discuss regulatory compliance matters. This closed session is necessary to discuss regulatory compliance matters and it requires a second. Second. Right. Secretary, please call the roll. Barrett? Yes. 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 So what we're going to do is we'll yeah. this area here and then that area there. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you need me to help stay out of that, I'm going to stay out of that. I'm going to stay out of that. All right, put you in that corner and we'll put you in this corner. All right. It's by power. All right, sounds good. We're going to try to sneak on by. Oh, okay. <sighs> Yeah, <laughs> 